Oh my gosh! The first image from the James Webb Space Telescope! And here it is! Uh, galaxies to the edge of time! Oh my gosh! You know how big and airy this is on the sky? Take a grain of sand, hold it at arm's length, and ask, how much of the sky does that cover? This is the area covered by that grain of sand, as seen by the James Webb Space Telescope a million miles from Earth. Oh my gosh. Oh, by the way, there's some spiky stuff here. These are just stars sitting on our nose on our own Milky Way galaxy, and it's called diffraction spikes, and it happens from the hardware inside the telescope. So just ignore these. Look at everything else that's in this image, especially they're galaxies that take the shape of arcs. These are really distant galaxies whose light was just minding their own business, and they happen to move by a supermassive cluster of galaxies halfway to us. And in moving through the fabric of space and time, they got distorted because of the gravity of this supercluster. Oh my gosh. And so it forms arcs that make a circular pattern around the center of the image. There's a lot going on here. Oh my gosh. Just congratulations to NASA, the thousands of scientists, engineers, Northrop Grumman, and everybody else who made this real, bringing the universe down to Earth. Keep looking up. All right, how about right there? Now, we're kind of done with the Hubble. It's still doing some work, but it's not like groundbreaking like when it was first launched. Okay. So we have the next generation of the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay. And used to be called the NGST. The next generation. <laughs> Space <laughs> Telescope. Okay. And then we find somebody to name it after, James Webb. Right. Who's not a scientist. I think it's the first telescope was not named after a scientist. Wow. But he was head of NASA while we were going to the moon. Wow, that's a, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. So big deal. the James Webb Space Telescope, scheduled to be launched in 2021. It's been delayed because it's like, it's unique design and engineering. You don't pull that stuff off the shelf. No. Okay, in fact, the telescope is so large, it doesn't fit in the fairing of the spaceship that's gonna launch it. Right. So they had to take the mirror and fold it up like the petals of a flower. Okay, then the thing gets launched, deployed, and then it unfurls nice. into the mirror. So brilliant engineering co concepts to make this thing happen. But that sounds dangerous. This is tuned to observe galaxies being born at the beginning of time. Wow. It is tuned precisely for that. And it can observe other things, all right? You can look deep inside. A, so it's tuned for infrared. Mm -hmm. to make that happen. And it's got a huge collecting area. So uh, it can look deep inside of gas clouds because infrared can penetrate clouds. And by the way, that's not something unusual to people's awareness because... It's still hot <laughs> on a cloudy day. <laughs> no. No, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when it's foggy out, you're not supposed to use your brights. Right. Because they're very blue. Blue scatters into clouds. And then it looks like a movie screen. A movie screen, right. So you use your regular lights, but if you had fog lights, it's like they're like amber. And they're, yeah, right. Okay, and, and fog, they'll punch right through the cloud. Oh, deep red lights would punch through even better. Oh. Infrared, the cloud's not even there. That's right. It's transparent, the infrared. Nice. So you take an infrared, point it at clouds in the universe, you see deep down in, you can see the formation of brand new stars and planets. Oh. Yeah. The James Webb Space Telescope is especially tuned to observe infrared light at an infrared wavelength that forming galaxies in the beginning of the universe, which at that time are emitting ultraviolet light, over the lifetime of the universe, the ultraviolet light redshifts through the entire visible spectrum and lands in the infrared. So this telescope was tuned to see the birth of galaxies in the universe after they had redshifted for 14 billion years. It turns out infrared is really good for probing deep gas clouds and seeing what's going on there. High on my priority list, um, 
well, I have a bias because I study exoplanets and I have so many burning questions that I want answered. So I really want to look at those first. Um, but the other uh, physics and our astrophysics that we're doing is super cool. For instance, they say that we can detect traces of the very first supernovae that went off in the universe. That sounds amazing to be able to see the very first galaxies, kind of the moment when the lights in the universe flicked on. That's tremendously exciting. To see the nearest galaxies in high resolution to the point where you can make out individual stars and watch them being born in real time um, on a kind of a galactic scale is very exciting. Um, we have these images from the ALMA array, which I mentioned earlier, which is this array of submillimeter telescopes in the Atacama Desert who are combining light to observe protoplanetary disks where baby planets are being formed today. We see the material. They end up looking like these complex disks of material that have structure like thin rings or spiral structure. And the, the current thinking is all of that structure is caused by the baby planets that are embedded in that dust and gas. With Webb, we will be able to find the planets themselves and make sure and verify that that theory that's what's creating this structure is due to planets. Um, so that's all the other stuff, but what I'm really excited about is to observe exoplanets in order to resolve some long-standing mysteries. For, for example, one of the most common, actually the most common type of planet that Kepler identified, and it appears it's one of the most common types of planets in the galaxy, is a kind of planet we don't even have in our solar system. And we don't understand their nature. We don't understand if this is more real estate for life or if it's something completely exotic and different. Maybe it's an ocean world, a planet like Earth that's completely enveloped in, in an ocean. We don't know. So I'm very excited to observe those planets and figure that out. We got to love Hubble because of the beautiful color pictures it sent back to us. If most of what you're doing is spectra, making is in the analysis of rainbows, then people will rely on the science you say comes from it rather than from their desktop picture that they put from the telescope itself. Well, well just quickly, um, Webb will take beautiful images as well. It has cameras on board that are taking images, so you will see some um, fantastic new vistas. Um, but I think the transformational science is in the what we call spectroscopy. Neil will let me say that word. Other <laughs> news outlets have, have, have told me not to say that word. Well, you if, already if said rainbow. Like, you already said rainbow. So, so <laughs> we'll kick it up a notch yeah, since we... We, we got I the snuck rainbow it out in of the on way. You. I <laughs> snuck it on you. So spectroscopy is the study of rainbows. And we the, the rainbow of light carries so much information with it. That's how we learn about the universe. And so one thing Webb could do is to really seed this notion into the public consciousness about how we utilize rainbows to learn about the universe. That already would be a tremendous leap forward for our collective consciousness. Um, but in addition to that, we're going to learn so much about all of these different objects. And really what I'd like to say is Webb might not be designed for life, as a life detector, but it is one way station on the way there. And the decadal survey already put forward the plan for the next flagship mission beyond Webb, which will be that life finder. And it's going to make use of all of the physics that we learned about how planets form, evolve, and, and what makes a planet potentially habitable and where the most likely abodes of life are going to be so that we are well positioned to use that telescope that comes later. And you will be alive if you are in high school today. You will be alive when that first discovery of a living world hits the, the headlines. Uh, remind us where this thing is getting planted. It's not just in Earth orbit like Hubble. That's right. It's in a very special place. And uh, this particular place is behind the Earth in, in what we would call the Earth's magneto tail. Okay. Whoa. And it's called uh, L2. It's a That's a new a anatomical form. part, you know? Yeah, the mag <laughs> yes. That's the right. Magneto tail. Mm. The magneto tail. It, it sounds like a new X-Man. No, magneto tail. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
So, so that's, that's how you remember to pronounce magnetosphere correctly, is think of magneto and then put a sphere on the end of it. Good, there you go. <laughs> nice. All right, so this but, is on the other side of the moon, right? No, it's directly behind the Earth in line from the Earth to the sun. Oh. Interesting. L2 oh. is behind us. And, and it's a unique place because what's happening is uh, in that location, it's really orbiting the sun. But because it's behind the Earth, it would move slower around the sun than the Earth does. But here's where the Earth comes in. The gravity from, from the Earth pulls it along. And so not only the sun's gravity, but the Earth's gravity keeps it in a nice position we call L2, which is like 920 million miles away from the Earth. So this has nothing to do with the moon. Moon keeps doing its orbit around the Earth right. like, it, like right. nothing's happening while this spacecraft is still out there. Is there a mode the telescope can go in that is, because uh, what I always loved even telling the public about that we do as scientists is, of course, you design an instrument for what you intend to find, all right? That's how you know what the parameters are and what the specs should be. But is there a mode where it's just looking for nothing, like a serendipity mode? Mm. So in case something shows up that nobody ordered, nobody was looking for, and we end up scratching our head when it shows up. Like every other telescope in New York City. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, uh, like Hubble, you know, which decided, okay, we've got some spare time, let's just stare in an area, and then found the, you know, fabulous array of galaxies that it did, there'll probably be some time when we will, you know, look in a particular area and then just turn it on and see what we find. But at the moment, it's really well subscribed, as we would say. You know, we have 100 hours uh, uh, open to the planetary scientists to make a variety of measurements of solar system objects. That data will come in and be available to all the other planetary scientists. And, and then many of the astronomers uh, will have already accepted proposals and they'll be, uh, you know, following, following that uh, schedule that they've created. But that won't really kick in until six months after launch. So each image then Nicole represented a branch of study for the telescope's abilities. So I, we got one, which was the distant universe, early galaxies, um, gravitational lensing. We have your spectra of the chemistry of exoplanets. So what were the other three? Yes, so we have um, a another galaxy image, but it was an in-depth called Stefan's Quintet. And okay. so it's five galaxies that are relatively nearby <laughs> and they're interacting so that's the really neat thing there and so you see it love me Stefan's quintet yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what, what do you mean what do you mean by interacting oh so all galaxies are always moving and away from each other or moving towards each other and so this is a grouping where they eventually can basically come together and oh. morph into each other and like strip each other of stars and huh? whatever to form a brand new galaxy later yes. on. <laughs> and what's, what's fun about it is when galax galaxies are extended objects, they're not points of, of gravity, mm -hmm. they're extended. And so when two galaxies see each other, yeah. and feel each other's gravitational forces, they begin to distort each other according to the strength of gravity across their, their physical size, which is not the same. Right, because if you're at the distant point, that's going to feel a little less gravity than the point that's close up, and so as a result, you get this shredding of a galaxy as it comes near another guy. It's a beautiful, it's like a, a beautiful train wreck. Um, would you agree, Nicole? That they're, they're gorgeous. Yeah. Also, okay. The most mind-blowing thing to me about that quintet is all the galaxies behind it too. <laughs> There's just like, <laughs> like the field is photobombed with galaxies essentially. <laughs> so, okay, the ones in front are fascinating, absolutely. But then it's like behind there, what the heck is going oh on? Oh my gosh, because yeah. I grew up, you know, because like I said, me and Stefan's Quintet go way back. <laughs> But in the pictures of Stefan's Quintet, that's kind of the only action in the photo. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. So yeah, you're saying, was... so you're saying the James Webb Space Telescope, even if your professional scientific interest is Stefan's Quintet, somebody else might be able to use the data that happened to be in the background of your image 
to study something else. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> there's just wow. data. There's galaxies everywhere, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we've got three of the images. What are the yes. other two? So there was also an image of a dying star. <laughs> so oh. it's a planetary nebula, they call it. But it's one of these beautiful, it has like shells of material around it. Basically, the star has died, a star like our sun. And it has evolved and shed its outer layers over time. And it's created these like bubbles of material where there's interactions with gas heating each other, heating other gas up and and spreading elements out through the universe. So it's like this beautiful transition of a dying star and it's feeding the universe now. Does that have a colloquial planet. name for it? Um, for that nebula, yeah. it does. Because Chuck, we, we name our stuff, whatever yeah. this thing looks like, we name it. Uh, Did you know there's a Pac-Man nebula out there? Did you know that? I saw that, the Pac-Man, uh, uh, which I love. Uh, yeah. what, what's the dying star so, nebula? It's the Southern Ring Nebula. Okay. Southern, so that's, that's kind of colloquial. not even interesting. Yeah. Southern Ring well, Nebula. Okay. All right. But, if, well, but cool. if you look at the image, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of rings, like, of material. So yeah, I think that's, that's where the name comes from. Not as creative as others that no. we have named up there. Yeah. It's, so, cool. Okay, yeah. give me one more image. Okay, then there's Karina. This is a region, another nebula, yeah, with star formation. But this one is like zoomed in. You're seeing just incredible amounts of gas and dust. Like you're seeing through the gas and dust to see stars forming behind it wow. and heating up the gas and dust. And I'm telling you, you have to look at these images high resolution online, you know, because you can just zoom in for days <laughs> and see this material. You just keep zooming in. Yeah, it's something amazing. you couldn't do with Hubble. You can zoom yeah. in a little bit, and that was good in its day, right? Oh my well, God! We're not we're not done, you know. This is just the beginning. <laughs> uh, allow me to remind us that unlike Hubble, which orbited Earth 360 miles up, this thing is parked a million miles away in the opposite direction of the sun from the Earth. It's pretty wild. Okay, yeah, and so it, I say parked, we're all, orb it and the Earth are orbiting the sun together. And so it, so basically, if you look back in the Earth direction, the sun will always be there. It has some motion where it is, okay, but it's not gonna drift away from that location, even though there's some movement within the location. The, the point is, occasionally Earth will block the sun, right. but the value of this is, you always know which way the sun is right. at all times, okay? Exactly. It's behind you, okay? Right. <laughs> all right? If you're gonna take a picture of something that's dim, you either have to illuminate it yourself, which we really can't do for the early universe, that doesn't work, <laughs> or you can take a long exposure to allow the light to accumulate. But while you're taking that long exposure, you can't jiggle the camera. It has to right. be perfectly, perfectly stationary. Still. So Chuck, just to repeat, we can't take a flash picture of the outer oh, okay. universe. So right. we have to open the exposure for a long time. Okay, so now watch. Uh, different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum tell us different things about the universe, right? So if you're gonna do that, you need telescopes that specialize in the chosen band. And by the way, we didn't even know light came in bands other than visible light. And somebody had to discover that. I mean, just think about it. Why would you have any inkling? Why would you believe at all that there was a kind of light out there that your eyes could not detect? Right. Here's the cool thing about the James Webb Telescope. It has a special reflective surface on its mirrors that are tuned to reflect infrared with very high efficiency. That's number one, reflect and focus. Number two, if you're trying to detect something that is a very low temperature, what happens if you have a temperature and you're the detector? You end well, up detecting you yourself. Exactly. So, so you need a way to cool the telescope. So we could send up cryogenic liquids and things, but they would eventually evaporate or, or gain temperature. And that, so what we figured out to do, we, not, not I, the engineers who were tasked with this, um, that telescope has a series of thermal baffles between it and the sun. 
All right, and so those, just take a look at any photo of the full telescope deployed. These, these, the, they're basically screened. They're like sheets that are, that are put up, a series of, of them in the row. So sunlight comes and hits one of them. It reflects some back. Others get absorbed and gets retransmitted to the next sheet, but that gets resent back. There's this multiple, triple reflections. And at each layer, the amount of heat from the sun is dramatically dropped. Okay? Gotcha. Dramatic. So by the time it comes out the other side, it's barely there at all. And wow. so the temperature of the telescope can now drop to what is basically the temperature of deep space without any influence of sunlight uh, uh, increasing its, its body temperature, if you will. That's, that's wild. All right. So do things like the James Webb Telescope, will that make us think about the calibration of time and the universe in a different way or just it literally enlighten us that's, that's as to what happened? That's an excellent question. So all it will, quote, simply do is take us to a place in time. Forgive me for using a place and a time reference in one sentence. Take us to a place in time yeah. where galaxies are being born. So we get to fill in the storyline. So you go back to the previous end zone. So the James Webb Space Telescope, if I just did a fast calculation in real time, uh, will go back to the seven yard line. It's a lot of universe between one end zone and the other. Yeah, but right. what that means is we will have access to almost the entire playing field, almost the entire timeline of the universe. Right. From seven yards up to a hundred yards. This is an extraordinary triumph of modern astrophysics enabled, empowered by brilliant engineers that enabled us to to work with this telescope to begin with. The James Webb Space Telescope finding galaxies that should not be existing that soon after the Big Bang. How is that gonna change thoughts in cosmology and how the early universe formed? Okay, let me back that up a second and come back to you, Wendy, here. Wendy, why it should there be a time in the early universe where we don't expect galaxies? Like, what's going on? So in the very earliest moments of the universe, we had, of course, the Big Bang radiation from the Big Bang couldn't reach us early on. There was a, a very hot plasma, and it was too hot even for hydrogen atoms to form. So the photons from the Big Bang would hit the electrons in this plasma, and, and, and we don't have any information there. At about uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the expansion had proceeded to the point where the temperature had cooled enough that you could form hydrogen. And after that, the photons from the Big Bang could stream out and we can detect them today. They're all around. The background radiation has been detected from the Big Bang. Then with telescopes like Hubble, we can peer back into the universe. And with Hubble, we can go maybe 12 billion years back in time. And we could see tiny little smudges that Hubble could barely resolve and you, you couldn't get detailed information on those. This and is so 12 billion out of nearly 14 billion. So that's yeah. pretty far back. So we, I mean, that's, 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 pretty that's, far back. that's pretty good, right? 12 out of 14. It's very, very good. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a region of t a space of time that we have actually referred to as the Dark Ages, which is the period between when we can first detect photons from the Big Bang, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and maybe 12 billion years ago. And, and we have no information about that time. So one of the main scientific goals of the James Webb is to study the dark ages and to see galaxies forming, witnessing directly the first galaxies to form. So we know they're there. We're in a galaxy, we can see these faint smudges, but we have no information or had no information about that process. And that's what's exciting about James Webb is we're opening up a whole new window uh, and we needed an infrared telescope to do that. So, But aren't these galaxies Weren't they found in the Dark Ages? I mean, you wouldn't expect that, right? These new galaxies we're finding, yes, they, they are very, they seem to have formed very early on after after the Big Bang. So that, and, you know, I think and you're cool and you're okay with that. 
<laughs> I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm okay with whatever the universe did. I'm not going to tell the universe oh, what to do. <laughs> if they think, you know, that's our job is to go out and measure it. And, right. I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why I was excited about James Webb is we had lots of theories for how galaxy formation would happen. And, and you know, we're pretty certain about those things. But then you actually go and look and you learn something new. What we learn, I'm not sure yet. I think we have some more surprises yet in store. And in a way, that's the whole point of the telescope. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. You're, you're, and, and so right now, there's this, I think, um, excitement that maybe galaxies, very massive galaxies, form very early on. And our current theories tell us there was no time to do that. You can't possibly have galaxies that are that massive that early. But I think we need to explore a lot of other questions about you know what were the stars like that formed early on? Are they the same as the ones that are forming today? What was is there dust in the early universe that we don't know about? Were the properties different? Was the star formation rate different? The way that they formed, the distribution of masses. So it, w there's a lot of exploring I think we need to do. So you'll see headlines like you know the Big Bang is dead and um, standard cosmology is broken. And I, I think we need to just slow down a little and and really understand what we're seeing, which is really interesting, but we don't yet know, I think, what it means. What is the usable lifespan of JWST? And when it runs out of station keeping fuel or whatever it is, is that enough into the future so that at this L2 point, since you said earlier, that could be a, a place where other telescopes hang out, might it be a place that astronauts visit to maybe refuel it and keep it going? Such good questions. Okay, first of all, humans, what we fall in love by like, what, the fifth date? That's pretty quick, right? I made that okay. up, that statistic, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we fall in love pretty quickly and, and Webb will give us um, five to 10 years. So it's baselined for five years, but it has enough consumables on board to last for 10. That is significantly different than Hubble and it's out at L2 where it's not serviceable yet or now. Um, the plan, I hope, I think, I've seen a little bit of is to create a cis lunar station and from a cis lunar station it's like a like the international space station but it's out closer to the orbit of the moon and when you get out at those distances you don't need a very big velocity kick you know slingshot velocity rocket velocity kick to get out to L2 it's easier so if we can do that we should be able to build telescopes at L2 service telescopes at L2 send astronauts out there and back keep in mind that the L2 is four times further away than the moon is so it's it's a million miles away it's quite a long distance but even though that sounds really far and difficult a cis lunar station would help to make that a reality and i do think that's part of the long term plan not within the next 10 years though. So once the astronauts do get out there to L2 or their robots, it would probably be archeological, not um, active. Archeological, wow, <laughs> I like that. So so the future frontier science, I, one day will be archeological for a next generation. That's, <laughs> that's, that's simultaneously beautiful and disturbing. 